Russ, I know you were born in 1950, October of 1950, here in Ackworth. Um, why don't we just start out by uh, asking you to talk about what it was like to grow up in the 50s and early 60s in Ackworth, Georgia. It was a beautiful experience. Um, in the 50s, there was no crime in Ackworth. Um, it was the end of the war. Um, my fondest memories were with Ackworth Beach. Uh, my older brothers riding me on the crossbars of their bicycle up to the theater. I believe the first movie I can remember that I saw was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And the old theater was, I think they turned that back into a bank uh, after they shut the, the theater down. Going to the uh, Doyle Ragstall's uh, coal and ice house and watching us, watching Mr. Ragsdale grab a huge hunk of ice and throwing it in the machine and it crushing it and coming out in big long paper bags and we would take it back home. Uh, in the 50s, all my friends, we all rode bicycles. I had a little swim bicycle that knew every bump and crack in every sidewalk on every street. I was blessed to have very, very many friends uh, in Ackworth that we all rode bicycles together and rode to the lake. Um, I had, I was very blessed, but yet being a McCall in my situation, and I'm speaking only of my situation, is a blessing and it was a curse at the same time because my mother had six children. It was like two sets of children and she always called Mose Ham. And Ham is short for Herbert Arthur Maddox McCall. He was named after my mother's three brothers. And then there was Sue, who is Eunice Mary Sue McCall. And at least I forget my oldest brother, who I idolized and was kind of the father figure of the family, of uh, the children, uh, is Moses Nathaniel McCall III. My father was a junior, and his father was Moses Nathaniel McCall, who was the head Baptist missionary in Cuba for over 20 years, and my father was raised in Cuba. Um, my mother waited five years after she had Mose, Ham, and Sue, and I came along in 1950. You my the first of the second group? I am the oldest of the three little kids, mm -hmm. and everybody referred us to the three big kids and the three little kids. And I was that mean little McCall boy. Uh, How the, much uh, older than you is Moses? Moses was eight years older. Moses and Ham had a year between them and then two years between Ham and Sue. And then five years, Mama had myself. And two years later, Claire was born on June the 2nd, 1952. And Merle was born March 18th, 1954. And to hear my mama tell it, tell the story, Merle was conceived by the bear on Altoona Creek. Um, Mom and Daddy loved to camp and loved the outdoors and loved to fish and all. And my father was telling her about there's bears out here. And as my mama always, my mama always referred to Daddy as red. Uh, he used to have red hair but she always called him Red. Nobody else in town called him Red, but my mother. And anyway, 
he was a long, tall drink of water to hear her say that. And they had these canvas tents, but they had cots and one cot over here and one cot over here. And after Daddy started talking about the bear on that had been seen around Altoona Creek, he started wiggling the, his toe on the end of the tent. And to hear my mama say, that's how we got Merle. So he is the baby of the family. Was, uh, that wasn't long before she got evicted mayor the first time. Correct. Time. She had um, some little kids at home. Then. Absolutely. And um, she was on the Lake Authority in 1955. My father was Mayor Pro Tem, I believe, if I remember correctly. And my father did not like politics. And he told me many times, if you want to keep your friends, don't talk about politics and don't talk about religion. And my father was a pretty closed mouth man. Uh, and I, I was my mama's boy. Uh, Mom always said, you love the ones that cause you the most trouble. And Mose and I caused her a lot of gray hairs. Mose and you? Absolutely. The, the oldest of the, each group? Absolutely. Mose was a notorious prankster. Um, couldn't drive very good either. Uh, I believe when he was practicing learning how to drive, he um, concaved the side of Daddy's car on the corner of the house. Uh, one time in our gravel driveway. Um, speaking of wrecks, the only wreck that I can remember that I had, my parents were going to Florida with uh, Claire and Merle, and by this time, Mose and Ham and Sue were in college, or they were in college, and I had uh, football practice, so I'm 16 years old, and Collins Avenue, we lived at 115 Collins Avenue, and right before you got to the front of the house is a extremely sharp curve and a huge oak tree on one side. I've seen more than one car hit that oak tree, um, but we had, it's, it's funny, Collins Avenue ended somewhere past the one other red light that was right there, what we call the holla, where we would sled when it would snow and all. But then it picked up just around, when it made the curve, there was Sam Pepper lived in a brick house, and in between Sam, J.C. Jolly lived there, and on the other side of J.C. Jolly, Mr. Salter lived there. So you had a Salter and a Pepper and Mr. Jolly in between there. Well, <clears throat> speaking of Rex, uh, the first time I ever really met Mr. Salter was head on uh, in my father's old Ford uh, Galaxy, and I used to see how fast I could come down Collins Avenue and whip whip right down the gravel driveway and it had rained uh, and the road was slick and I was just about ready to go to football practice and I have a buddy of mine with me and kind of swerved out in the middle and gonna whip into the gravel driveway and all of a sudden I'll never forget it was a 1956 white and blue Chevrolet four-door Bel Air and it belonged to Mr. Salter, and I met him head on. And <clears throat> Mom and Daddy came home to Daddy's car being total and sitting in the side yard. That was, that was a special moment, but they had many special surprises uh, coming out of me. But <clears throat> all in all, 1950s, uh, I can remember we had our first organized baseball team. 
I believe it was in 1959. I believe I was, well, I was nine years old. We had four teams, the Yankees, the Indians, the Braves, and the Cardinals. Dub Williams was our coach on the Yankees. I believe Mr. Nelson was the coach of the Indians. Little Boy or Johnny Scroggs was the coach of the Cardinals. And I'm not exactly sure who the coach of the Braves were. But um, being having two meals in Ackworth, uh, You know, we had a lot of children that had a lot of idle time, and we used to play on the flats all the time down behind Ackworth Elementary. When I was in the first grade, we were having to go to half classes. And if you're anybody growing up in Ackworth, everybody knew Miss Charlotte McClure and Miss Fanny B. McClure. Um, I happened to have Miss Charlotte. Also had her for a guidance counselor when I was uh, in high school also. And I love Miss Charlotte and Miss Fanny B. And see, everybody knew all the McCall children. Uh, I was raised not to notice color. Uh, we never had racial problems here in Ackworth. Um, I was raised to say yes, sir, and no, sir. And if I call one of my uncles by their first name without addressing them as an uncle, um, well, I never did. I, I knew better. And the children of today, I don't think they quite have uh, the respect that we were, were, we were taught. I was very fortunate to have both parents um, have degrees and go to college. Um, in the 50s, if one parent had a college degree, that was a pretty special thing. Uh, most women worked as homemakers and raised their children. Um, I can remember, well, how Mama got to be mayor, this is how it all started. She said, Red, I want you to... And I, kind of putting this in my mind, but I know I knew my mama. Uh, she said, Red, I want you to run for mayor. We need you as mayor. And as daddy would have said, hell no, I'm going down to Florida and I'm going deep sea fishing. My father loved a quail hunt and he loved to fish. And he, uh, being raised in Cuba with a famous missionary father. He was probably in the church every time the doors opened. And I can remember him going to church one or two times, but he was mostly seeing patients or going on house calls. Uh, but when he could, every chance he got, he had an uh, old wooden fishing boat and the, Dr. James, who was the pharmacist here, they were both great friends. Uh, Dr. James had the same exact wooden fishing boat that Daddy did, and they parked it, they chained them together, and what we call the cove, uh, you could walk down Collins Avenue, and there was a bridge built across the cove to go over to the Ackworth Beach House. Um, my first experience at actually, uh, well, I ran away from home when I was four. My first act of defiance, and I can remember like it was yesterday. I can't remember what I said yesterday, but I can remember 60-some-odd years ago some things that were very paramount. Um <clears throat> Mama had let Mose and Hamasu go to the beach and go swimming, and I wanted to go. And I had to stay home. Um, 
we were raised by uh, African American help, and I was taught to respect all all colors and races. My mom and my daddy did not; uh, they were not racist at all. Whoever came into our, my father's office. They sat right with everybody else because we're all human beings, and I was taught that, and and I was taught to respect them. Uh, I love people like Pompey Harden. He came over and he would fix um, the plumbing. Edna was his wife. Uh, Addie, I can't remember Addie's last name. She worked for us. Um, she. She burned down, or her house burned down, and she uh, died inside of it. Um, Essie, I can't remember Essie's last name. Essie quit because I was such a stinker. Mama, Mama always said, I can't get anybody to help me take care of the house because of the way I used to act. And I guess it was because I was so angry that my mama wasn't there. She was up there with daddy and up at the office. But I can remember being on the side porch. And I've got another story about the side porch in a minute. But I was in my underwear. I was about four years old, and we all ran around no top, no, no shoes or shirt. And I knew where my father's office was. And I went missing and I walked up Collins Avenue past uh, the Keenels I'm not Mr. Keenel had the two stone columns uh, on Main Street and he had this bulldog named Spud I was scared to death everybody was scared to death of Spud but he was behind the gate but when we would walk to the First Baptist Church on Sunday morning. That dog would try to eat us alive, you know, just scared to death. But I walk. I can remember walking down the sidewalk, across the Ackworth Baptist parking lot, down past uh, Mr. Fowler's place and the Allens, and I was right there at Collins Funeral Home, and I saw my the oldest of the Henderson girls. There were four. Henderson women, girls that I grew up with, Judy, Sally, Sandy, and Nancy. Nancy was my age. We were all, Nancy and I, were, we played together all the time. But I saw Judy walking down the street, so I hid behind a tree right in front of Colin so she couldn't see me. Well, I got some stairs uh, walking past Allen's 5 and 10 and crossing over and uh, coming to Lemon Street, and I walk inside my dad's office, and my mama, every, my father, everybody's panicked. She is calling the uh, civil defense to go drag Lake Ackworth to try to find me. So <clears throat> anyway, that was one. That was my first act of defiance that I can remember, and. Uh, I knew every inch of Lake Ackworth. We, my oldest brothers were lifeguards. Um, Mama would take us there to the beach and we didn't have a lot of towels. Um, and when we'd get out of the water, Mom would say, run up and down the beach and dry off. So here, Claire, Merle and I, we'd be running back and forth, you know, trying to dry off. and. <laughs> It was just fun. I knew I fished all the time, camped. Uh, I swam. One one thing about Lake Ackworth, um, I loved to fish at the little dam, and there's a spillway there. Now, I'd seen where people had drowned there before, but I knew every inch of Lake Ackworth because I paddled Moe's around Lake Ackworth so he could fly fish, and I was just like, uh, the first trolling motor ever invented. But when people were in my spot, 
and I wanted to go fishing, and I can I I would we used to jump off the little damn bridge mostly on the aqua side, and then we'd slide down the spillway because it had this green slime, and it would upset the people so badly, you know, they'd just get angry and leave, and then I could get my fishing spot, you know. Uh, and I remember before they had all the regulations with uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, Ackworth flooding and the water being up over the little dam, and at the tennis courts, the water was about that far underneath the goal. So uh, th this was in the 60s. And I remember when they were going to get rid of the carp. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I know I wasn't old enough to drive, mm -hmm. but everybody in town, the day they put the Department of, well, they didn't have the Department of Natural Resources then, but they uh, put rotenone or some chemical to cut off the oxygen for all the fish uh, to kill all the carp. And everybody in town, if they had a little plastic boat to fish in and a net and a bucket to stick the fish in, because all the fish started floating up. I think this is right before the Chautauqua. It was in the wintertime, but it that was a hoot. And then for three weeks, all you could see were the buzzards cleaning up the mess, you know, and they were so full, the buzzards couldn't even, they'd fly about 10 feet and couldn't even get off the ground. But- Was the idea they were gonna restock the lake with- Correct. The bat, uh, whatever they wanted to put in? Make, make it a better uh, fishing area. What, what are they, bass? What, what are they- uh, There were plenty of bass. Um, I, I don't think it's over at the McCall Primary School, uh, but my oldest brother, Mose, probably caught one of the biggest fish that ever came out of Lake Ackworth, and it was, uh, it was around 19-pound uh, blue channel cat, and there's a picture of him somewhere. I don't have it. But my father was a, he, he loved the go trolling. And there used to be an old road bed that went from where the Bobby Kimmel's train, where they had a train in miniature golf all the way across the lake before they made Lake Ackworth. And that road bed on both sides, that's where my father and Mose and I learned how to uh, troll. Uh, my, my father loved a strawberry bomber. And there were two things my father said, well, three things that my father would not loan out. One was his wife first off. The second was his fishing rod. And the third was his shotgun. And my father had the two best bird dogs of anybody in North Georgia. And one of his dearest friends, Arthur Graves and Angie, who I used to go spend the night with, I love them uh, very much. Uh, but he kept uh, daddy's bird dogs. And I can remember going across the, one of the last remaining covered bridges um, that went over Pumpkin Vine Creek to get to Arthur Graves' house. And I knew all the Graves, and I, I loved everybody in Ackworth. My parents loved Ackworth and all the people in it. Um, I went on house calls with my father and my mother, and I, I can remember going out to the Graves. We would go get Christmas trees during Christmas. And of course, you know, little kids like Claire Merle and I, we'd go chop us down the biggest Christmas tree and my house I grew up in had 12 foot high ceilings. Well, we'd have to cut the top out of the Christmas tree just to get it in the house, you know, and it was this big around, you know, and 
Uh, but that was that was a great family outing to go cut your Christmas tree down. And I can remember uh, I would spend the night with uh, Mr. Graves, and they had a coal-burning pot-bellied stove and it had all these quilts. And uh, his wife, Angie, there's nobody I know on this earth that could fry chicken any better than she could. And she could shoot a chicken with a 22 rifle and it would be fresh and she would prepare it. And uh, I remember sleeping uh, with Arthur and he had this old pickup truck and he would take me out in the woods and set me out and let me go squirrel hunting. And hunting stories like Neil Jolly who lived down the street, uh, he, had, he had this moped. I'll never forget that moped Neil had. Uh, but he and Mose, or it may have been Ham, or it could have been Mose, Ham, and Neil, got lost out um, in Arthur Graves' that in the woods there. This is off the four lane. Now this is way before 75 was built and Highway 41 was called the four lane. You know, and um, John Fr Frank Abernathy had uh, soul bait out there, and also um, Ed Fowler. I I won. I think Ed was his first name. He had a place down off of Main Street. Uh, before Johnson's drive-in was ever conceived, and basically across the street from there. Um, my first my first job, I've, I've worked all my life. I worked 34 years with the state of Georgia, but um, I started working when I was 10, uh, picking up paper cups or snow cone cups on Ackworth Beach when uh, well, he wasn't my coach then, but Coach Albert Matthews was uh, operating the beach house. And I can remember going, I got graduated to the snow cone machine, and eventually I got to become the um, cotton candy because we got to play records back then, you know. Uh, and I, I loved Ackworth Beach, and there was a... Uh, there was a Tasty Freeze, I think it was called, um, right there at the corner, right next to the Sulis's, uh home. And I can remember walking to the beach, um, and you couldn't walk for a very long time barefooted because of that asphalt would get so hot, you'd have to kind of jump off. And, but I can remember uh, what we call hunkies, which I, I'm not sure what they call them now, but it was a mm -hmm. chocolate bar and we called them hunkies. Mm -hmm. um, and the picnic and the Coates and Clark's uh, barbecue, the most fun I ever had was riding cardboard down the, the hillsides right there at the Coates and Clark's when they would have the community cookouts. and. I recently, when Bob G's father passed away, I happened to be going through town just to reminisce a little bit, and I'm not sure what they call it, but it was the building there, uh, the community house at Coates and Clark, mm -hmm. and it's now a restaurant. So we, I stopped in there and ate, um, but it brought back memories of my mother making me take tap dancing lessons. Well, this guy, I love to dance, but uh, I don't know if Jim Eaton was made to take tap dancing lessons and Larry Paris, who took, they were two of my best friends growing up. Um, as far as women friends, and I, I 
all of them were my girlfriends. I loved each and every one of them. There was Rhonda Matthews. There was Dottie Keenan. There was Beth Ragstall. There was Jan Eaton. There was Marsha Hamner. Uh, I'm probably leaving off Krista Nolan. I, I loved all these women. I, and to this day, they're still very close to my heart. Is, is Jim Eaton the one that became the chiropractor? Uh, no, Jim, uh, Jim's father owned Eaton's department store and he has a twin sister named Jan. Okay. They're two of my closest friends. Okay. Um, we all rode bicycles together. Mm -hmm. and um, You started sometime back to talk about how your mother became mayor. Oh, I'm, you, I'm sorry. Your father took off to fish down in Florida. Correct. I'm so sorry. I'm, I get off on these tangents. I, my wife can't even understand or follow my storytelling or if I'm trying to say something. Okay. Daddy says, he doesn't say no, but hell no, I'm not going to run for mayor. And one of his really good friends is Alton White's brother, Willie, Willie White. And they used to go to Carabelle and go deep sea fishing. So daddy goes deep sea fishing and mama kind of as a joke and kind of half serious decided to sign up for mayor you know put her throw her name in the hat well <clears throat> my mother was responsible well when she was my mother helped my father my father taught my mother everything he knew about medicine uh, he went to my father was he went to went Mars Hill junior college, then he transferred to Wake Forest, and he graduated from Bowman Gray uh, Medical School and Emory Medical School, and he yeah, was a surgeon. Two, two medical schools? Uh, correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a surgeon, and he had to quit because of his dubertrans, uh his fingers crippled over. That's, and uh, I believe they came to Ackworth in 19, uh, December 1939. Um, Jenny May Terry is, uh, and Geneva Haynes, Haynes were two of my mother's real close friends, but Jenny May, I think there was a Dr. Terry here before, uh, Daddy, and Daddy bought the office building from them. I'm not sure. I'm not clear on that. Uh, but I was always hearing about Jenny May. I, I met her in many years later. And uh, so mom was at the office, and it didn't matter if you're black, white, purple, or polka dot. If you were sick, you were welcome in my parents' doctor's office. You sat right next to anybody else because that's how my parents were. And back in the 50s, we never had racial problems. The uh, African-American people had their schools in the elementary, but then they had to go to Lemon Street for high school. But <clears throat> see, I, I was raised mostly by my older brothers and sisters and by um, the the maids, we call them maids. Um, they were just like mamas to me, and they whip my rear end just like my mama would if I got out of line. And Mary Roberts stayed with us uh, for many, many years. Um, there are many people in Ackworth, other than my parents, that I, I'm not going to mention any names, but I, they were. They're beautiful people. They did so many things for so many underprivileged people uh, to help help out. That's what we did in Ackworth. We helped one another. But anyway, my mother uh, would ask an African-American that she was seeing 
uh, you know, that was sick. And she said, are you registered to vote? No, sir, Miss Mary. And everybody called her Miss Mary. Um, my mom said she'd look out the back door window of the office, and right there is City Hall. And she said, you go down there, and you ask to register to vote. And if they don't let you register to vote, you tell them, Miss Mary sent you down there, and you come back up here and you tell me. And she never campaigned at all, and she was elected with a landslide that, that one year. She was mayor four terms, three consecutive, um, and I believe Howard Henderson uh, what became mayor, and then she came, was re-elected mayor one more term. I've got 1956. She served a one-year term like maybe somebody had resigned or died or something. She was elected, uh, no. and the first time? Uh, for the first time in 1956. Okay. Now, I, I may be mistaken, but I can remember... Uh, Twice, the second time it was so embarrassing. But Claire and Merle and I walking down Main Street with a sign strapped around our our shoulders saying "Vote for my mama." Uh, when you're 12 years old, uh, it was a little embarrassing for me. Uh, the next time, uh, I think she took office at the beginning of 1961. Uh, so I guess the election was in '60. You had been ten years old, maybe at that mm -hmm. time, and so you have this. You're wearing the same. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I was. I was pretty embarrassed. I you were. Um, but like I said, when um, I was blessed, but I was cursed being in this family because uh, every I I learned to fight at an early age, and I got picked on a lot because of who my parents were. Um, because everybody thought my parents were rich. Well, they weren't. You know, my father, I, I brought some of the books, you know, that where he saw patients and there were plenty of no charges and uh, credit and my father got paid in vegetables or keeping his bird dogs or or whatever, and it wasn't about the money. There are, do there are no doctors like that anymore. Um, it's all about, well, there, I take that back. I'm making a blanket statement, and I, there, there are many doctors that care about human life, but the doctors of my father's day, that Hippocratic Oath meant something. And Dr. Cobble, who was a fine doctor also, I well respected in the community um, and well respected by my family. Um, they cared about their patients. And I'm talking going out in the sticks, you know, in getting stuck and having to walk half a mile in the mud just to doctor a uh, poor African-American family out on Tanyard Creek or somewhere like that or further because my father and mother, my father taught my mother how, well, he needed help. He was the first doctor around, and he, it wasn't just Cobb County. From Ackworth, you can throw a rock into Paulding County, Bartow County, and Cherokee County. So he not only had Cobb County, he had four, three other counties. And um, it didn't matter whether where you were from, but I can remember going out in the sticks, which now are subdivisions and superhighways and... Um, 
this, that, and the other. You know, it's just a different world today. Mm -hmm. um, your mother accomplished an incredible amount of just nitty gritty little things that are infrastructure type things that are so important for a city, like natural gas and um, uh, street lights and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a great quote I thought from her when they were talking about closing down the schools to keep them from integrating. This would have been about 1960 and there was a group called Help Our Public Education Hope that mm -hmm. uh, she seemed to be very supportive of that she made the comment that um, you know talking about closing down the schools can you imagine having to stay home with six school-aged kids? <laughs> My mother didn't mix words and she, uh, she she cussed like a sailor, you know, and... Um, is she cussed? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, she cussed like a sailor, and you did not want to ruffle her feathers. Um, my mother was the type of person, she, uh, if she did not like you, she wouldn't talk about you behind your back. She would go right to you, If and chances were, if you were a rotten scoundrel, or if my mother thought you were a rotten scoundrel, you had about a 99.5% chance of being a rotten scoundrel. But my mother loved everybody, um, scoundrel or not. Um, and there's a friend of mine uh, that's deceased now named Maggie Harrison. Uh, I'll never forget uh, when she told her story uh, she said that no matter how vile and horrible a person may be or the acts of violence that they have ever done and how black their heart is, there's this one little patch of light that is in every human soul, and that light is God. And... We're all God's. We're all God's creatures. I tend to get emotional sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> I have a gracious God that has spared me because when I was growing up, you could have asked any of my friends; they would have bet you a hundred dollar bill I'd never made it to live to be thirty years old because I was wild in the streets. I hated Ackworth, Georgia. I wanted to never hear country and western music again. I wanted the big city life and to party and be just a wild hippie. Now, when I was growing up, I graduated in 1968, North Cobb High School. We never saw any marijuana in my whole life. I didn't know what it looked like. Um, I never saw pot or marijuana until I was probably around 20 years old. Um, I am in recovery now. I don't make any bones about it. Um, what I once thought was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me has become probably my finest asset because it's a way that I can show other people that have the same problem that I do with uh, the demon alcohol, um, how Scotchy, who most people refer to as God and Jesus, I am a Christian, um, but I call him Scotchy just because I can and he gives me permission to, um, how he influenced my life and it wasn't anything that I did. It was, uh, I am a miracle, a walking miracle. And he's kept me around for a long time. My mama always said I should have been a preacher because I could tell people what not to do because I done done it. But um, I'm very humbled and grateful that I've been spared uh, a lot of tragedy 
And it's a shame that people have to hit a bottom and they look around for the answers instead of looking up. And that's the only way you're gonna find an answer because it happened to me and my arrogance, everything I have is subject to recall because I was sober. Now, this is a very candid thing. This is about me. It's not about any of my family. I was sober 15 years, and um, one day I kind of put God in the back seat, and I thought I might be a big boy and drink again, and it took me 10 years to get back, and so now I'm going on eight years recovery again. So um, that's a little bit about me, but only by God's grace am I uh, sober today, and I have a much greater, deeper understanding. Uh, religion to me is man-made. Uh, spirituality is of God. And I can, I've heard a lot of people that can get up and pray the most beautiful prayers. And if you don't walk the walk and only talk the talk, then um, you're missing a whole lot. But that, you know, I was instructed and taught um, everybody is created equal under the eyes of God. And did you, um, you grew up in the Baptist church here in Ackworth before you revolted against it, I guess? Yeah, I, I'm Baptist to the bone. Now, I, <laughs> my mama wasn't exactly politically correct, and I've been to charismatic churches. But back in the 50s, you know, my mama and most people who were Baptists and never been to a charismatic church called them holy rollers. Mm -hmm. And um, because they had bands and stuff like that, and they praised God. And Did you have a holy roller church around here? Absolutely. Where was it? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I, I remember Oral Roberts. Uh, used to come set up at mm -hmm. over by the Big Chicken before it was the Big Chicken. I think it was Miss George. Roberts was there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he set a tent up um, over at Miss Georgia Jerry's, uh, which was before the Big Chicken, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. And yeah. I think New Way Cleaners. Uh, and back then, back when I was growing up, we all burned garbage in the backyards. We didn't have garbage pickup and we had milk delivered and I can remember uh, New Way Cleaners, Daddy always had these white starch shirts and my daddy always loved to go to uh, Chandler's Barbershop, that's where all the gentlemen went before you know they went to work and one of my favorite, uh, one of my daddy's favorite people on this earth was Sieb Chandler. And there was, uh, I loved all the Chandlers, and there was Oscar Hunt, and uh, you never had a haircut unless you had Sieb Chandler cutting your hair, and he'd have a cigarette hanging in his mouth, and you didn't have an ash fall on your shirt or whatever, you know. You didn't get, you wasn't getting a haircut. But uh, my father became real ill when I was growing up. Um, he taught Mosenham and Sue how to fish and hunt and all. And so it was, they basically taught me uh, because my father had rheumatoid arthritis and was crippled. Uh, so he he was fairly sick. Uh, but when uh, I can remember many, many times, Steve Chandler would come over to the house and he and Daddy would watch Dizzy Dean and Pee Wee Reese uh, on that Sunday afternoon ball game. And my father loved the New York Yankees. And Steve Chandler hated the New York Yankees. And I'd sit there and see them banner. And Steve would cut Daddy's hair and shave him. 
you know, this is when he was getting a lot sicker. And Aubrey Chandler um, and Oscar Hunt. And I'm, I'm sure there's some more people that were in the barbershop, but I can remember that bubble gum machine putting a penny in it. And, you know, it's, it's the little things that I remember like that, you know. So, Russ, I think we've got plenty of good, good material from you today. Well, I'm sorry, I could talk for hours and hours about Ackworth, Georgia, and the people growing up. Um, it, it's, I, I've lived in Stone Mountain, I've moved away. Um, there are two regrets that I have in my lifetime. The first is not finishing my Eagle Scout I was a life scout, and I was three merit badges away from the Eagle. Uh, Mr. Smith was my scout master, and we formed a Sea Scout troop. And we, Johnny Smith, Bobby Fromm, Alan Jones, and myself, that was our Sea Scout troop. But we used to go jump off the railroad trestle and crawl under Clark Creek Bridge and all. The second. What Creek Bridge? Uh, Clark's Creek, uh, uh, not, I'm, excuse me, not Clark's Creek, Third uh, Army Bridge. And Alan Jones, I witnessed him falling onto the rocks mm -hmm. and getting up and walking away from it. Uh, you know, I'm 14 years old. Alan had his license. Uh, but the second regret, and my biggest regret, is my first marriage my wife amy pressured me into selling my father's office mm -hmm. and i did not want to do that but i i was so pressured i wound up selling it to this day i regret it and i i go by and i look at it and, and you know a big tear comes to my eyes um and when I, I came to meet um, one of the founders of Help Save the Ackworth Depot, Mac Turner, and I looked out the window of the old hardware store, I, I guess it's a bar now, um, and I just, I saw that back door and just brought a tear to my eye. And it, Ackworth, to me, Reminded me of Midtown Atlanta now. Um, it's a beautiful place. And if it wasn't for the traffic, I almost bought Dr. Reed's old house on Seminole Drive. Um, I lost $1,000 I put down as earnest money, but then just the traffic is just horrendous. But I love Ackworth. Uh, my parents are buried here and my heart will remain here for as long as I live. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I am very honored to have been asked to do this. Well, I'm sorry you had to drive so far to get here today. It is my pleasure. Are we through? That's it.